Good evening. No one's going to respond? Good evening. <laughs> Look, I grew up in the AME church. We b believe in call and response. So, uh, And like my minister says, the more you respond, the quicker I am in sitting down. So, um, I'm Nicole Austin Hillary. I'm the director and counsel of the Washington office of the Brennan Center for Justice. And I'm so pleased to have you all here with us this evening. For those of you who are not so familiar with us here at the Brennan Center, we are a nonpartisan think tank legal advocacy research litigation litigation strategic communications organization. I know, say all that 10 times fast. We are affiliated with NYU School of Law and are very happy that our friends here at NYU in Washington are hosting this event this evening. We like to do at the Brennan Center what we call fix those broken parts of our systems of democracy and justice. And in doing so, we work on issues varying from voting rights to money in politics to ending mass incarceration to ensuring that our liberty and national security is protected. And we use all of those different prongs that I talked about earlier, litigation, research, advocacy, to try and do just that. We are so pleased this evening to have this with my colleague, Jennifer Weiss-Wolf, who has really changed the landscape when it comes to policy and advocacy with respect to the issue of menstrual equity. So we are really looking forward to having an engaging discussion with Jen uh, to talk about her book this evening. Um, but before doing that, I have the pleasure and honor of introducing the Honorable Grace Mang of the great state of New York. Congresswoman Mang is serving her third term in the United States House of Representatives. She represents the 6th Congressional District of New York, which encompasses the New York City Borough of Queens. I know there are some Queens people in the room. There always are. <laughs> Congresswoman Meng is the first Asian American member of Congress from New York State and the only Congress member of Asian descent in the entire Northeast. Yes. <laughs> At the start of the 115th Congress, Congresswoman Meng secured a seat on the Appropriations Committee, where she said she advocates for more spending on infrastructure and education. She also sits on the Commerce, Justice, Science, and Related Agencies Subcommittee. In 2016, Congresswoman Meng was elected a vice chairwoman of the Democratic National Committee. Congresswoman Meng introduced legislation earlier this year, H.R. 972, entitled the Menstrual Equity for All Act, to provide greater access to free or reduced cost feminine hygiene products for low income and marginalized communities. Her bill would require jails and prisons to provide free menstrual products to women inmates as needed and allow homeless shelters to use federal grant money to purchase tampons or pads. Congresswoman Meng has also persuaded the Department of Homeland Security to ensure that certain FEMA-funded shelters can use budgets to purchase menstrual products. No easy task. Furthermore, after a letter was sent to the Department of Justice in 2016 demanding that menstrual products be freely accessible to female inmates, the Bureau of Prisons issued a guidance in August 2017 mandating just that. Prior to serving in Congress, Congresswoman Meng was a member of the New York State Assembly. Before entering public service, she worked as a public interest lawyer. She is a graduate of the University of Michigan and the Benjamin Cardoza School of Law. And we are so pleased about her leadership in this issue area. And we welcome you, Congresswoman Mang, to give us some opening remarks. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and to NYU um, Brennan Center for hosting this wonderful event here today. Big fan of the work that, that you do. Um, you know, I wanted to especially thank uh, Jennifer for her amazing leadership. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Um, I met Jennifer, I guess, about two years ago, and I met her. One of the events that we first met was when she was advocating for New York City public school students to be able to have access uh, to feminine hygiene products. Uh, Jennifer has been advocating for menstrual equity from anywhere from the schools, elementary schools in New York City, uh, to across the world in Nepal. <laughs> and so I'm so grateful for her. Um, some of our ideas uh, and, and legislation has stemmed from pieces that she's written, op-eds that she's written to help educate our communities uh, and men and women across our country. Um, and really for the, the very effective work that you've been doing, creating systemic change at all levels of government. It's so important, so thank you. 
Um, but, you know, I'm really excited to be here today. I want to thank each and every one of you for even taking interest in this subject, uh, for the work that you do, and helping to change the culture so that men and women are more comfortable in talking about this issue. And that's really one of the first and most important steps to changing the culture. Um, a few months ago, we held the first ever uh, hearing on Capitol Hill, a panel discussion actually on this topic, and it was great to see uh, interest that in these important issues that has only increased even just within the last few months. And people ask me how I got involved in this issue, and you know I have to say it's because of everyday advocates like yourselves. Uh, a high school student wrote a letter to me expressing the concern that many women in homeless shelters weren't able to have sufficient access to these products. And the more I read about this subject, the more I learn about it, it's not only affecting uh, women and young girls in third world countries, but it's, a, it's happening and affecting uh, women in our country right here in the United States. Um, and her letter and this issue, you know, really moves me. In this day and age in the United States of America that we have women in prisons who have to beg or barter to receive feminine hygiene products, that we have homeless women who don't have access to these products because their shelters might not be able to purchase them or to afford them. Feminine hygiene products, as you know, are not even included as qualified medical expenses under flexible spending accounts, which allow individuals to purchase other medical items using pre-tax dollars. So our policies at all levels of government uh, do not treat feminine hygiene products as essential items, even though I think we would all agree that they are essential items. Um, a large part of the problem, as I mentioned before, is there is this cultural stigma surrounding the term and the topic of menstruation. And that's, you know, that is changing, and it's all due to all of you and the great work that you do. And so just taking the step and working together and normalizing conversations about these issues, about periods, being able to say the word <laughs> menstrual hygiene, say the word in public, carrying a pad or tampon or whatever you use to the bathroom freely in a co-ed working environment. Um, this all helps us achieve legislative success. And we have to continue on working to break the taboos uh, around menstruation. And so, um, was mentioned before, we have two bills uh, on the federal level. One is the Menstrual Equity for All Act, has five different sections that would help different population of women and girls access and afford feminine hygiene products. Um, includes provisions such as making products available at no cost and on demand to female inmates. Um, providing a tax credit for these items to low income individuals and adding these products to the list of items that may be purchased by a homeless shelter if they're using federal grants. Um, another bill is the Menstrual Products Right to Know Act, which requires ingredient labeling on these very products, which is currently not mandatory. We have an absolute right to know what we are putting inside our bodies, and my bill would cement that into federal law. So we still have a long way to go. Uh, obviously, these bills have not passed, uh, and you know, I, I would, I don't know if you know it's going to happen in the near future in this uh, political climate. I won't get political here tonight, um, but you know, we we do have a long way to go, and. You know, locally in various states, we've had some successes as well. I talked about the New York City public schools, um, but nine states have gotten rid of the tampon tax, a tax that treats these products as luxury items, even though we know that they're not. So obviously we can count there are a lot more states that we need to work on. Um, but you know, I, I really, I also want to acknowledge a local city councilwoman that Jennifer and I work very closely with, Councilwoman Julissa, Julissa Ferreras Copeland, uh, who helped uh, make that change uh, in the city of New York. Um, and so, you know, our momentum is only building with advocates like yourselves. We are literally seeing progress made every few months. 
And so I, I am hopeful in this political climate that working together and helping to educate people, we can definitely make more of a difference. And really, uh, this is really a human rights issue in so many ways. So I just wanted to thank you for having me. Keep up the great work. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out uh, to people and um, enjoy reading her book. <laughs> I wanted to also say for those of you who may be in DC, next Tuesday afternoon, we're having um, a product drive with free wine and drink and snacks. <laughs> um, donations will benefit the Greater DC Diaper Bank and we're asking people to bring a box of pads or a box of tampons. So it's next Tuesday, December 5th uh, at the DNC. So thank you. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Gretchen Borschelt. I'm Vice President for Reproductive Rights and Health at the National Women's Law Center. And we are delighted to be partnering with the Brennan Center, the NYU John Bradamus Center, and NYU Washington, D.C. to bring you this program tonight. For those of you who don't know the National Women's Law Center, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization here in Washington, D.C. We have been working for 45 years to protect and promote and expand opportunities for women and girls in this country. And we work on a range of issues that women face. So we work on tax and budget issues, we work on health and reproductive rights, we work on education, we work on workplace issues. So all of the issues that women face, we are engaged in. And that also means that we work on behalf of women who are facing all kinds of discrimination, and in particular work on behalf of low-income women and bringing voices to bear in these fights, and certainly working on behalf of those who face multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. That all means that we're really excited to be part of this event, and that's because this topic is one that is about women's health and reproductive rights. It's one that's about women's equality. It's about women's dignity. It's about women's economic security, and it's about women's ability to participate participate in education and in the workforce and in our social life of this nation. And so I'm so excited that we have this, these fabulous individuals tonight who are going to explain how the movement for menstrual equity is all of these things. And so let me introduce them and get right to the discussion. So first, right here to my left is Jennifer Weiss-Wolf, who is Vice President of Development at the Brennan Center. She's an attorney, and she is the author of this new book, Periods Gone Public. This is my copy. Well, it's the center's copy. I've claimed it as my own, but it's actually, it's actually for all of us. Um, Periods Gone Public, Taking a Stand for Menstrual Equity. So Jen's advocacy is really ca catapulting the conversations about periods and menstrual equity and policy solutions. Um, and then we also have Malika Garib, who is a deputy editor and digital strategist of Goats and Soda, NPR's global health and development blog. And we have a fan already in the audience. She's amazing, so I can understand why. So Malika wrote the NPR story that cemented 2015 as the year of the period. And we can talk about, are we continuing to see that year happen, right? We're a couple of years past that, and where are we now? So these two fabulous individuals are going to address how periods kind of suddenly became a thing. They're going to talk about how, in an otherwise pretty treacherous political environment for women, this is a new affirmative campaign around menstrual equity that's really taking hold and developing high-profile bipartisan support. And they'll also discuss what's next for menstrual equity. So I'm really excited. I hope you all are, too. And please help me in welcoming Jen Jennifer and Malika. All right, so um, 2015 was a pretty big deal for both of us. Um, that's when I wrote this article around New Year's about why 2015 was the year of the period. And you also came to your realization that you had this revelation that spurred this advocacy campaign that led you to writing this book. So why was 2015 so special? Um, what happened? Oh my gosh, okay. A lot happened. I actually, you did write the article on New Year's Eve. It was December 31st. Yes. And I know this because I had my kind of menstrual epiphany, if you will, on New Year's Day 2015. So it was especially meaningful to me when your article came out because that you know, marked a full 365 days of obsession, of awareness, of advocacy, of really just spurring this new movement. Um, I, I'd love to actually just entertain you a little bit sort of with the story of how it happened for me because it was not prefabricated or planned in any way and there's actually I think something about that that makes this whole movement that much more vital and authentic to me. Um, on New Year's Day, uh, 
364 days prior. I had kicked off the new year, not with any sort of big New Year's Eve party, but by swimming in the Atlantic Ocean at the Coney Island polar bear swim um, on that morning. And yes, it's cold, and yes, it's crazy. And no, the water's not warmer than the air. It's really cold. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a tradition that I have that I do with a group of friends to really I don't know, set our intentions for the year to jolt our bodies and our minds into some state of presence. And um, so I never think it was an accident that I learned about this issue on that very day. We had actually dressed up as Wonder Woman, for real. I have the pictures. And um, four middle-aged women in you know capes and handcuffs, really telling the year how it was going to be. And um, when I came home that day and was doing the very important task of posting my pictures on Facebook, um, I came across this flyer um, that these two kids in my community had posted um, that they were collecting tampons and pads for our uh, local food pantry. And they'd created a little fact sheet with it just to explain why these items were often unaffordable or out of reach for low-income people, why the food pantry itself didn't have a budget for them or able to provide them, and donations weren't always forthcoming. Um, and I, I was just kind of gobsmacked. I, um, I often think for what it's worth, too, if I learned about this on some kind of like mucky day in March, I might not have reacted so strongly. But because I had all that adrenaline, I just, I, the obsession sort of was sparked right there. And I, and I basically spent the rest of that New Year's weekend combing the internet for everything I could find about this issue. Why had I never heard about this before? I've been a social justice lawyer um, and part of the reproductive rights and women's rights movements for all of my adult life. And quite honestly, I don't know about others in this room, I had never given that a second thought before that moment. It had just never crossed my mind. Um, and interestingly, all the things I learned that day from, or that weekend from that very intensive Google search um, have continued to sort of frame the way the work's unfolded as, as I've you know, as I've implemented it, and I've, and and others um, have done the same. So these are the things I learned real quickly that day that that just kind of guided my thinking. That this this wasn't a surprise, especially to people who were working on this issue um, in other parts of the world, the global south, and in Africa in particular, um, where the United Nations and the World Health Organization had deemed this a human rights issue and public health crisis, um, and that the interventions, w whether it was policy or social innovation, um, you know, truly these grassroots efforts where women were being taught entrepreneurial skills to make their own pads, um, sell them amongst each other, educate each other, do that as part of you know, crashing through the religious and cultural stigma around menstruation. Um, that was really prevalent. It wasn't, it wasn't kind of like New York Times headlines, but there was, there was plenty to read there, and it was very inspiring to me. And as Congresswoman Meng said, I've had the incredibly good fortune to travel to Kenya and to Nepal and to India to meet with policymakers and innovators um, and, and learn from their experience and see how we could translate that into action at home. Um, but really here in the United States at that time, January 1st, 2015, not December 31st, 2015. Nobody here was talking about this as a systematic problem that would require any sort of systematic intervention. Um, there was one piece that had been written by the writer uh, Jessica Valente in August of 2014 called The Case for Free Tampons, which actually makes a lot of the same policy arguments that we've been successfully making over the past two years. Um, and what was mostly remarkable about that piece was the enormous amount of right-wing vitriol that it inspired. Um, you know, kind of the most grotesque Breitbart pile on that you can imagine, really sort of zeroing in on this intersection of hatred for poor women. Um, but in any event, at that time, um, I did what I thought was the most reasonable thing, which was to kind of collect my thoughts into an essay um, with all that New Year's adrenaline, I decided to submit it to the New York Times on a whim, and they ended up publishing it. And that, for me, ended up being um, really sort of the first, the first public uh, segue into elevating this discourse. And then what happened over 2015, there's two pieces to the story. There's, there's, there's my story, which, which is told in the book, which is how 
I started trying to conceptualize this in a very Brennan Center way as a policy agenda um, and thinking about not just donation drives um, or even sort of innovative interventions, but what systematic policy change could look like. And while I was doing that, continuing to write about it and reaching out to lawmakers about the, you know, the feasibility of that, other activists we're coming to the same conclusion at the same time, and that's just kind of a fascinating thought, the power of an idea, how an idea is born, how it germinates, how it spreads, um, and everything from a marathon runner who discovered at the starting line or just before that that she'd started her period and decided as a matter of both personal comfort and political statement making that she would run with no menstrual products. Um, from Instagram smackdown of a, a, a picture being uh, pulled off of Instagram that depicted menstrual blood for violating its decency standards. Really, it was just a woman sleeping in her bed who accidentally uh, leaked blood on the sheets. That was what the photo was. To, to the first um, Republican debate where um, then nominee Trump, there were 17 other people at the podium. It's hard to even imagine that was the time, but he accused um, Megyn Kelly of having blood coming out of her wherever um, as, a, as a retort to line of questioning he didn't like, leading to this whole social media um, you know, response. Anyway, this entire sort of cacophony of, of voices willing to go public and speak about menstruation, I assume was, was there, you, know, you were the one who cataloged all that at the end of 2015. That was our year of the period. It's a long answer, sorry. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> and that barely even scratched the surface of what was going on. So you think this outspokenness um, about menstruation in mainstream media, on social media, that's what sort of led to this change in public opinion you know, about periods? The media has definitely been a critical partner in this movement. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that, too, is very much, at least from my perspective, a, a, that, that comes from how we think about policy change quite often at the Brennan Center, that changing public opinion and changing hearts and minds is, is absolutely a critical component of being able to achieve legal or policy change. And the media often is the, the mouthpiece or the, you know, the, the outlet for, for making those messages. So um, yes, I, and social media, interestingly, as we've all seen, has become such a critical part of our political discourse. And for that's true sort of of all the issues we focus on. But for something like menstruation, that has been so off the table and so both stigmatized or mocked or marginalized or just invisible maybe on the best of days, um, the ability to control and narrate that story um, and, and bring it out of the shadows um, and sort of allow people the freedom to talk about it has to be part of the advocacy. I've certainly treated that as part of the advocacy. So I do think, I don't think that's what happened, but I think that's a big critical piece of it. Let's talk about the shadows that you speak <laughs> of. Um, so sort of to understand why 2015 was so game changing for periods, um, tell us a little about the stigma that surrounds periods, the stuff that we talked about in the shadows, um, both in the US and globally. Um, how does that stigma hurt people who have periods? Again, this was something I'd never considered before. The stigma around periods is, you know, sort of as potent as we as we let it be. There's certainly religious stigma, um, and and I do some analysis of that in the book. There's cultural stigma, um, and I think that affects different communities in different ways. Um, certainly, you know, I imagine people have read the stories of young young girls who died in Nepal three this past year who are. Um, part of a ritual practice in the western part of Nepal called Chopaudi, uh, where, they're, where they're actually banished from their homes and need to stay in isolated huts during their periods. Uh, two died from asphyxiation, suffocating for after lighting fires to keep warm, and one died from a snake bite. So that's, OK, so there's a clear, clear correlation between menstrual, menstrual stigma and endangerment to health bodies and lives. Um, but especially here in the United States, I think that the stigma has affected us in that nobody who would suffer from the consequences of inability to afford or access menstrual products um, 
whether they're a low-income student, whether they're someone who's experiencing homelessness or otherwise using um, public shelters, whether it's somebody who's incarcerated and doesn't even have the agency to access those products as they need them, nobody wanted to ask. Who would want to raise that issue when that's like the biggest yuck factor or the thing that's going to, you know, sort of bring about the most revulsion on the part of who you're raising it to. When we, um, we'll talk maybe a little bit more about the New York City laws um, that were passed that Congresswoman Meng mentioned that now mandate the provision of free menstrual products in all of the city's public schools, shelters, and correction facilities. Um, but when we, we, we hosted what we call the, the Menstrual Equity Roundtable, and it was stakeholders from across New York City from from the after school programs, from the prison associations, to the Y, to health providers, to ask them what access looked like for their clients and in, those, in their communities. And they said, yeah, it's a problem. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to be the one to say, this is my problem. And that's where I think the stigma kept us from talking about it and kept us from acknowledging the problem. So um, this concept of people being treated unfairly in society because they menstruate is the basis of a term that you coined called menstrual e equity, which you just mentioned. Um, tell me more about this term and how it was born. It's funny because now when I talk about menstrual equity, I feel like I have a very deliberate rap about it. I do understand quite clearly what it means to me and why it is such a potent driver of policy. So I'll start there by defining it and, and explaining what it means and why I think it's been so effective. But the second answer is it just kind of evolved in a way that I think was less deliberate, even though I want to retell the story and say I've always had this vision for it. Um, I, the first time I ever used the phrase, it just kind of fell out of my mouth. And I was talking to a reporter. I had testified in Chicago. Um, about the, the city of Chicago on this whole tampon tax tally actually is another, another winner in that game. The city of Chicago passed an ordinance eliminating its city portion of the sales tax that's charged on menstrual products. It's 1.25% of a 10.25% tax that is uh, affected on people of sh in Chicago. But I had testified at the city council when they, when they had a hearing about it, and this reporter I said it to this reporter who was kind of crass, and she, she sort of barked right back at me. She said, what, what are you, that's not a thing. It's like the she dumbest thing I've ever thing. heard. And I said, no, it's a thing. It's a thing. She said, well, <laughs> define it. And I said something. Um, and, and then her story said, when pressed to define menstrual equity, Weisswolf said. And then it's this kind of clumsy quote. It's in the book, the clumsy quote. I Googled it. But um, so I've refined it a lot since then. I'll so say. What is your, what's the new definition? <laughs> so the, refined, the new refined definition is that equity, menstrual equity really is a matter of access, participation, and engagement. And without access to menstrual products, freedom, education, um, for the people whose bodies menstruate, they are then denied uh, full participation and engagement if they cannot afford and access these products, whether that includes the ability to be productive and present in school um, and, and gain access to an education, whether that is the ability to be productive and present at work and contribute to the economy, or honestly, to just walk down the street. Or kill them, How, like what happened in Nepal. S yeah, certainly, I mean, at the most too. extreme circumstances. Yeah. But bringing it back to the US policy perspective, like I said at the beginning, um, I read pretty early on that the UN and the World Health Organization defines this as a human rights, crisis, a human rights issue and public health crisis. And I agree with those perspectives. But I worried, as I thought about forging a policy agenda here in the United States, that those would not be compelling to lawmakers here in the way that um, participation and engagement and contribution to society would be. I mean, especially go back to 2015 and think about the candidates for president at the time. Um, we do not have a consensus that women's rights are human rights in this country. We do not even have a consensus that, that we're 
entitled to health care. So those, to me, seemed like we were going to fall down a very typical rabbit hole if we went that route. But equity might catch people off guard and really tapped into, I think, core American values about what it means to be um, a, a civic partner and player in society. So you made the strategic decision to sort of go that route, an equity versus human rights. Yes. Okay. So yeah, how does that translate into domestic policy now that you've figured that piece of it out? Well, the very first step in, in trying to forge a policy campaign, at least as I saw it, again, this was back in 2015, was to get lawmakers willing to talk about menstruation in the first place. You know, the only other time that menstruation on its face has ever been part of our policy, our domestic policy agenda, was after the spate of toxic shock cases in the 1980s when there was dialogue about regulating um, the ingredients for transparency around menstrual products. And as Congresswoman Meg said, she's a new bill out about that now. But that's uh, 90s, that's 37 years right, 27 years, 30 years of um, no progress on legislation that was first introduced in the mid-90s to, to create safer um, rules around the menstrual products that we use. So that was it. That was all we had to go on. So the first question was, well, how are we going to actually get legislators to talk about this issue, to take it seriously, and to do it in a way that sort of directs them in the right um, mind frame. So the tampon tax, which was mentioned, as folks may know, um, basically that translates to regular sales tax that's applied to menstrual products, um, and they are not afforded an exemption the way other um, items deemed a necessity are, things like food and prescription drugs. Um, to take on the tampon tax seemed a pretty benign way to get legislators to start talking about menstruation, in particular the economics of menstruation, with a goal of not only tackling that, that issue, but opening the door to broader questions about economic, um, e you know, the economics of menstruation and the ability to afford these products and the broader questions about equity. Um, from your work in um, menstrual equity, um, I was surprised to learn in your book that it's a bipartisan issue. Um, why does it have so much support across the aisle? That's such a good question. The, the, it's a little bit of a surprise. It's a little bit of a surprise. Not a huge surprise, but I mean, it was, I was, it was intended to kind of create neutral um, neutral ground around the idea of menstruation. And the tampon tax in particular seemed a good place to start, um, not only because, like I said, it was sort of a benign or, or easy way to talk about the economics of menstruation without having to get too, too deep into questions about poverty um, and other social justice issues, but this is where I go off the bread and center script a little bit, sorry. <laughs> um, Republicans don't like taxes. They don't always like women. They might have had to decide which they didn't like more mm. on the question of the tampon tax. And you'd be amazed to see that there are anti-tax and libertarian watchdog sites that have said, this is the best issue. Look what it does for us. This is actually kind of a funny aside. I, I point to Breitbart a lot, partly because they They've written about this a bunch, and they used to take pictures off my Instagram um, and use them in their articles. Um, and um, it's definitely they, legal. <laughs> they were. Oh, it's good to know. They no, were, I, I and they, know. you know, they were sort of predictable about it at first. But they've actually, they actually started to come around. And in fact, they were so opposed to Congresswoman Meng's Menstrual Equity Act, and and, and you know, again, getting into sort of the the intersections of, of, of poverty and poor women and menstruation, that it sort of forced them into a little bit of a corner on the tampon tax where they said, well, we think that's really unfair, but, um, but the, 
you know, this question about poverty, we don't think poor people should get free things, but we do think that the tampon tax seems pretty sexist and unfair, to the tune that I actually pieced together a bunch of articles from the Resurgent and Breitbart and lots of the right-wing sites and pulled out their own lines and actually created my own little makeshift op-ed that was supportive of the tampon tax, and I really wanted to publish it and say at the end, I didn't write a word of this. Miley Yiannopoulos wrote this. Um, but, but in any event, it has been bipartisan of the the 24 bills around just the tax issue alone that have been introduced over the past two years, um, four have passed. Uh, for those who follow policy legislation, that's record speed. Um, and of the four that passed, two are signed by Republican governors, Governor Scott of Florida and Governor Rauner of Illinois. Yeah, I know, that's pretty wild. <laughs> Um, so this is just a reminder. Um, this is the Brennan Center for Justice program at NYU's Bradamus Center. Um, and we are talking to Jennifer Weiss-Wolf about menstrual equity. Um, I'm Malika Garib, your moderator. You can follow the Brennan Center uh, for Justice on Facebook and Twitter, watch their programs on YouTube, and listen, listen to iTunes podcasts. And all their reports and media are on their website at Brennan, brennancenter.org. So that's my little plug there. So on the bipartisan thing, there's another interesting piece, too, that what leads to the clip that we'll just show in, in just one second, but I want to say something about it first. So um, you know, obviously, the tampon tax isn't the end game here. To me, it was always it was something that we wanted to accomplish, but it was a starting place, again, to talk about the economics of menstruation. Um, and um, among other things, it's led to um, so these access bills, like New York City's, which again have been mentioned, um, have led to uh, replicated versions in the states, California and Illinois, both passed laws this year, again, signed by Republican Governor Rauner of Illinois and, and Jerry Brown in California, mandating menstrual products in, um, in all the public schools in both of those states, which is also really kind of groundbreaking stuff. But um, incarcerated populations, too, uh, have been have been a, a clear focus, um, and Congresswoman Meng's bill focuses on on that population. But so too uh, did a bill that was introduced this summer by uh, U.S. Uh, Senators Booker, Warren, um, and Harris and Durbin um, called the Dignity for Incarcerated Women Act that um, is a criminal justice bill uh, focused on women inmates, but among other things, it included a provision um, for access to menstrual products. Um, and the two really interesting takeaways from that are when the bill was introduced, that was the headline. The tampons and pads were the headline. And I actually called the reporter to ask her why in such a far-reaching bill she chose that aspect of it to focus on. She said, well, that's the no-brainer. That's the thing everybody agrees on. That's the, that's the neutral place. And I almost dropped the phone. I thought, <laughs> that is progress from the year of the period. But in addition to Congresswoman Meng's bill and then the Dignity for Incarcerated Women Act, some combination of that pressure led the Department of Justice on the Bureau of Prisons to uh, issue this guidance this year uh, mandating menstrual products and for federal inmates. And a reminder again, that's not, that wasn't, the f that wasn't Obama's Department of Justice, that was Jeff Sessions' d decision. And you know, if that's not really a signal that we've reached some level of bipartisan interest, I don't know what is. But on that note, uh, Senator Booker was invited to be here tonight, and he wanted to be here, um, but wasn't able to make it work. But we do have a clip of him speaking about menstrual equity in the context of this very bill. We'd love to show it. That's why I join with my colleagues to introduce a bill called the Dignity Act, focusing on the crisis we have with women in the criminal justice system. It also focuses on issues like menstrual equity, the assault on dignity of women not having access to quality, safe, sanitary products is unacceptable. So we have work to do. Anyway, Senator Booker is now talking about menstrual equity, so I will say to that Chicago Sun-Times reporter, it is a thing. Um, <laughs> we made it, it a thing. There we go. Wow. Yeah. From from your words, you did you make up that term on the fly, by the way? Yes. You did? Like, and then to, to Cory Booker's mouth. So there we go. It is a thing. Um, so let's sort of do a case study of the legislation that passed in New York City from 2016 that basically um, made sanitary products available in uh, 
prisons and schools and also um, removed the tampon tax, ended the tampon tax. How did that happen? Um, what were some of the challenges in achieving it? And um, what were the criticisms? So the, just to be clear, the tax in New York State, it was a New York State bill, York and State. then the city bill made menstrual products available to in on all the city facilities. So it's the city's Department of Education and Department of Homeless Services and Department of Correction. Um, interestingly, it was, it was not a huge uphill climb to get the council and core members of the council um, on board. We were determined to get um, unanimous support for it, and there wasn't unanimous support from the start. Um, this is such a fascinating story. One of the one of the holdouts who was opposed to it was a council member, uh, a Republican council member from Staten Island. And um, right before the vote was to happen, his his own um, middle school age daughter had her period for the first time in school. Um, was sent to the nurse's office to manage, even though she only asked to go to the restroom to take care of herself. Um, large city public school somehow bungled the pass from, you know, the, the process of getting from the classroom to the nurse's office, the nurse's office to the bathroom, back to the nurse's office, back to the classroom. Not only did she end up missing like a half hour of class for something that really should have taken her about three minutes to manage, she got a detention. Um, and he was so horrified and outraged on her behalf, he changed his vote and convinced others to too, wow. and we got a unanimous vote. Um, and um, one, of the, one of the interesting sort of things that was almost a reverse challenge is that one of the benefits we had in, in pushing that legislation was that the champion of it, Jalissa Ferreres Copeland, also happened to be chair of the city's finance committee and had last word over the $83 billion budget. So there was never a question about creating room for the budget in this, which, which does come up in other, in other jurisdictions. And whenever she was asked about what this was going to cost the city, not only you know, would she answer the dollars and cents, but she had this great answer that I urge others to use too, is she said, honestly, in all of the years I've managed the city's budget, nobody has ever asked me what the city's toilet paper budget is. Um, and that was, every time she said it, it was so much fun to watch the jaws drop around the room. Um, but uh, I think the most remarkable thing about the New York City story is I, I showed up on the council member's doorstep in March 2015 with this memo that I had drafted and all these ideas that I had. And she was able to look at it and go, we can do that, we can't do that, that's a crazy idea. I think this is feasible. From March of 2015, um, we had the, the bill was, um, we, our, our round table met twice after that. Bill was introduced March 2016, public testimony on it May 2016, passed June 2016, signed by the mayor July 2016. It was incredible. And it's really, it's the broadest reaching legislation of its kind in the world. Yeah, New York City rocks. <laughs> So we actually have time for only one last question, um, and then we're going to open up to the Q and A. Um, so, so obviously you're an activist for menstrual equity. What have you been working on lately? What's the next priority, and what can people in this room um, do to help achieve your goals? So I've been working on this book. Um, <laughs> this book um, was was a labor of love, um, and what the book does that I think is most exciting to me is it tells the story, you know, the year of the period is, is a character in the book, pretty much. It's, it's, it's what I define this new era as. Um, so I tell a little bit of the story that we've talked about tonight about how we got here, but what the book does is actually imagine this forward-looking agenda where we look at, you know, where we're certainly going to keep fighting to um, exempt menstrual products from sales tax in all 50 states and ensure access in, in, these, in venues like schools and, and shelters and, and correction facilities as widely as possible. But this, this actual philosophy of menstrual equity to me, can go so much further. It's almost the starting place of, of a whole new way of looking at our laws and looking at the way we legislate, especially um, laws that impact women's lives and women's lives disproportionately. So it really is everything from healthcare to public benefits to education uh, to the environment, um, you name it. Women are half of the population. We are, we are not the other. We are not the aberration. This is what our bodies do. In fact, I think that a lot of the current discourse around sexual assault and sexual harassment and, and hashtag me too and the idea that, 
this, this fury that nobody has been listening to us or taking our stories seriously. Um, menstruation fits right in that. This is just part of our daily existence. This isn't something special. Um, but our laws don't reflect this reality at all. And what this book does is challenges all of us to think about every single law by which we live and how it could better serve us, in particular if it focused on menstruation, but more broadly if it focused on the reality of our, our lives. So I challenge all of you to walk away thinking about that in the areas of, of of, of law and policy that you're involved and engaged in. Um, but I'd also ask you to do the most simple of things, which is to talk about menstruation very freely, to tweet about it, to write letters to the editor, to, to write poetry, to, to do anything that is your way of communicating with the world and normalizing menstruation so that you empower all of us to do so. Even, even I have to say the cover of this book was really deliberate. Please like read it on the subway like this, like <laughs> open and let people see. And maybe they're a little uncomfortable, or maybe they'll ask you. Um, but but really, we, there's there's nothing there's nothing to hide. And the more all of us take that to heart, the the you know the more vitality this entire campaign will have. That's a nice way to end this part of the yeah. discussion. And um, now we'd like to open it up to the audience. Um, so if you, I don't know where the mic is. Where's the mic? Mic's over there. Uh, oh yeah, there's two mics on both sides. Um, if you want to step up and ask, uh, say your name and a brief one part question, um, go for it. I'm Marilyn C. Faulkner. Uh, in France, the legislators have uh, uh, come up with the idea of uh, granting women two days off per month. It's part of the French uh, legislation. Do you think that this uh, would be palatable in the United States? Period leave, yes. Period leave has become the thing. Uh, Japan has been doing it since 1947. The Italian parliament introduced it as well this year. Um, I have mixed I have mixed emotions about it. I don't think the United States and our discourse is quite ready for it because I think there's the the inevitable pitfall of saying, "Oh, well this is proof that that women aren't fit to lead or can't can't get the same amount of work done as as their non-menstruating colleagues." Um, and I don't I don't want to paint women into that corner. On the same hand, I want to acknowledge I do personally as an activist and somebody who thinks about menstruation as a political agenda, I want to, I want a world where we acknowledge the reality of our bodies, um, that our bodies are different, that our bodies are our bodies, and that we can harness that for power, that we might have times where we need to recover or recuperate, that there are people who have serious medical issues connected to menstruation, um, that that are, are, are worthy of our, our care and acknowledgement. I think that the answer right now is a little bit of an in-between compromise answer, that we do have laws that are intended to protect us in the workplace um, around, again, around our health and around um, our care of our health and our bodies and ourselves. Um, and I'd like to, ex my idea, and I write about it in the book, there's a section in the book, is to explore the laws that we have currently and see how we can better reflect um, women's bodies and menstruation um, into the protections we already have, rather than carving it out or calling it out in a society that's that's probably still, despite the year of the period, not ready to have that conversation in a fruitful way. Hi, my name is Nia Evans. I work with the National Women's Law Center, and a lot of my work is on the school to prison pipeline and the impact on girls of color. So I really appreciate it, your example about how um, you know, menstrual inequality in school intersects with discipline and how girls can be punished for that. I would love to hear a little bit um, more about either stories or examples or things that you've heard about how um, students in school have been punished for having their periods. And I'd also love to hear the name of that con that legislator in New York who switched his uh, vote. I'm not going to say daughter. that publicly. That's not right, for right. public. Anything you can tell me <laughs> would be great. But yes. Um, well, you know what? So we did focus groups in New York City, um, and we had a couple of sessions with with kids and with their parents too, where they explained to us their experiences. Um, and they weren't always as overt about the punishment, although the ability, especially in sort of some sprawling city schools, to manage the the process of hall passes and things like that. So it wasn't 
just like even in that example, it wasn't you have your period, therefore you're being ridiculed or punished, but there were so many um, circumstances around it that just made it too much for a 12-year-old to manage um, that led to discipline. I think what, what the more prevalent stories that we heard were, um, were a little bit softer. It was kind of like inability to focus properly when they were so worried about that aspect of their lives. For, for, again, these are kids. These aren't people with their own budgets and control of their own budgets. So if their mom or dad's paycheck was coming on a Friday and they got their period on a Tuesday, um, and there was no money in the budget to ensure that they had the products that they needed from Tuesday to Friday, um, that caused a lot of distraction, disruption. Um, Interestingly, we, we heard also that kids were more afraid of being teased for, for lack of access or, or potentially bleeding on themselves or things like that than they were about being disciplined. Um, but all of that lends to an environment that is not you know, an optimal environment for learning. Um, so some kids would say they did indeed stay home. Some kids would say they went to school, but being in school, you know, they were only halfway there because they were focused or worried about other things. Um, all told, it creates an environment where girls are not having equal access to the educational opportunities in front of them for something as simple as a pad. Um, and I think that's really, really, like it's, it's, it's an easy point to make. And, um, and you know, and there are those who, who don't want to see life from the perspective of a 12 year old. So many people say to me, you're letting these kids be lazy. Why can't they just carry a pad in their purse? Why can't they just be prepared? Um, we provide everything else that a person needs to get through the day in terms of their restroom needs um, as a matter of regulation, as a matter of law, not out of the goodness of anybody's heart. This is something we've decided as a society makes us healthier, more productive. Menstrual products were never part of that equation. Now we're demanding that they be. And as these stories come to the surface, um, you know, I, my hope is that they'll be more that they'll be persuasive to people. I just have to share one other story. It doesn't completely uh, respond to your question, but this this particular anecdote has stayed with me always. Um, so we, we, we talked to parents, too. And there was a mom who um, was concerned about the provision of menstrual products because she herself was a teen mom, and she did not want the same fate and course of history for her, for her daughter. And by keeping track of the menstrual products in her home was one way she had reassurance every month that her daughter was not, in fact, pregnant. And that was the concern she had about the school providing them, was that it, it denied her that, that peace of mind. And I've never forgotten that, that mom and that story and that reminder that it's not for us to really assume anybody else's story or reality um, or intentions. Um, but providing the pads, hopefully, is one one small facet that equalizes the, the the playing field for girls in school. Hi, my name is Jan, and I love what you're talking about. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you're 40 years too late for me, <laughs> but um, I also want to bring up um, the concept of menopausal equity because menstrual equity goes right into menopausal equity, and so even if we may not need special products, there's certainly time off and the impact it has on one's professional career. It's, it's, um, that leads me to sort of a funny-ish story. Um, a lot of the folks who are involved in this movement and the fellow activists that I work with are significantly younger than me. Um, this, is, this is something that really ignites young people, I've discovered. Um, so I often get, get thrown this, this very slightly benign phrase of age diversity that I bring to the discussion. Um, I turn 50 next month. And, um, and often when, when I'm asked personal stories, which I am now about menstruation, do I have an awful first period story? Do I have a worst period story? I try to educate back by saying, actually, people's relationship with menstruation and their periods evolve so much over the course of one's life. And while it's easy to think that the stories that happened when we were 12 years old or 18 years old, you know, when, when you had this sort of horrible, embarrassing story, are the most palatable, 
Um, over the course of a person's life, your relationship with menstruation changes dramatically, whether you, you want to be pregnant, whether you don't want to be pregnant, whether you're having health issues, whether it is the end of the experience of menstruation. So yes, I agree that this is a very rich story that we're only s just starting to, to you know, sort of scrape the surface of being able to share these. And I do hope that this movement encompasses all of that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Florence. Um, I have a question about menstrual cups. About a year ago, I discovered menstrual cups and introduced them to my life. And I also learned recently that they've been around for since, since the, the 30s. Since the 30s. And I've spent this past year trying to convince a lot of friends that they should try it. And there's still a huge stigma surrounding menstrual cups. And I think a lot of it is because you see your own blood in liquid form. And I, I'm wondering what you think about menstrual cups and how that plays a role in this conversation. Well, I think that access to a wide variety of products plays a huge role in this conversation. And it, it's a fascinating facet of this movement in that products and product development and, and even sort of corporate branding of products actually intersects with, with social activism. That's something in and of itself that, that gives me a lot of, you know, kind of fodder to think about um, as somebody who's kind of always willingly be, been on the nonprofit activism side of uh, in my career. But that said, I think that the discussion has been really um, kind of excitingly charged around the idea that tampons and pads aren't the only thing um, that you know, we, we kind of treated them as the conventional go-to, but there are so many new companies that are springing up. A lot of them um, are either trying to, you know, sort of reinvent or re, re popularize um, a wider range of products, including menstrual cups. And I think there is a really, really strong following. I have a, a daughter who's always chastising me that, that I, you know, to use one like her. And, um, and you know everything from period underwear to products that um, will be more transparent than the government requires them to be, or use more natural products, you know, organic cotton or um, you know cardboard or, or no applicators for tampons. So the clearly a variety of products is something that is good for us and a good way to be as you know personal and proactive and even political about the menstrual choices that we make. One of the questions I often get about menstrual cups um, comes from folks who are concerned about the environmental impact of disposable products um, or the safety impact of disposable products and, and will say, well, why aren't you pushing for people who are low income to use menstrual cups? Because over the long term, it's more affordable, it's more cost effective. Um, and, you know, the answer is I think just like all of us wouldn't want somebody telling us exactly what it is we should be using. I certainly want to keep that power to make that decision um, for the person themselves. And something to think about when it comes to menstrual cups or when people ask that question is to, to understand really what it takes to use them in a healthy and responsible way. And if somebody doesn't have access to hot water or soap or, um, you know, even enough time spent in a bathroom because they're hurrying in and out of a public restroom, um, that's not gonna fly. The kids in public school, we pulled them, said we'd love to use it, but it's kind of awkward to get from the toilet stall to the sink and wash it without everybody seeing you or without accidentally, you know, making a mess. And you know, that that's a fair yeah, that's comment. And I did, um, I spent a lot of time um, interviewing people who are experiencing homelessness for this book and this advocacy. And again, another one of those sort of stinging comments that somebody gave me that I wasn't expecting was that when she is living on the streets or is taking refuge in a shelter, the bathroom, a public bathroom, is the least safe place to be. It is where predators go. It's where they know that women are alone. And her goal is to get in and out of there as fast as she can. And dealing with a menstrual cup doesn't fit that bill for her. So those stories matter. And you know, I think just like it's a personal, it becomes a personal you know, mission for you. It's great to educate your friends and others. and. Um, we should, we, we, we need to rely on the power of communication amongst ourselves, um, but then also respect that for different people, the choices have different significance too. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Can you hear me? 
I can hear you. I don't know if the, the recording can. Hi, my name is Bach. So, segueing into what you just said about like not imposing our ideals of what ideal menstruation should look like, um, how much of it do you think is an issue of menstruation equity as opposed to not accepting, um, not accepting women as equals um, in the United States and the rest of the world. And you, you can be radical about it. You don't have to be. But how much of it is also not having, I remember as a teenager going to high school here, not having the right kind of information. So there was shame, even in the yeah. United States, associated with having a period. So being 13, 14, and now 30, um, not knowing what to expect with the period. So how much of it do you think is really an access to products versus? It, it's all of it. It's all of it. It's like one, it, it's just kind of it's like menstruation. It's like a circle. You know what I mean? It all affects the other. I think that some of the ages old and religious misogyny that's rooted some of the beliefs about menstruation and, and that same sort of fuel that just has to do with women and women's um, empowerment and place in society, it's, it's all interconnected. Um, I, I do believe that if menstruation wasn't something that was, was, was affecting women, but either affected the full population or affected the other half of the population, it would very likely be treated as a, very, as a different kind of experience. Um, and, and a lot of these issues wouldn't exist, but it's not just because of the blood or the cycle or the process. It's because of you know, all of the systemic um, treatment of women you know, through, throughout multiple myriad cultures. So it's not really a simple answer, um, but the answer is it's, it's, it's all part of the same. Um, but taking it on in this very pragmatic, practical way where you say, this is the bodily process. This is what happens. This is how it's managed. Why would we treat it differently than X, Y, or Z? Pulls it out of that a little bit and forces people to to either own up to the fact that their that their beliefs are rooted in in some unpleasant you know truths, um, or and gives them a way to address it, um, you know that doesn't doesn't force them to abandon their power. I guess it's only just the start, though. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Well, um, on behalf of, uh, of the Brennan Center for Justice, our thanks to our partners, National Women's Law Center and NYU's Bradimus Center for generously hosting this event with Jennifer Weiss-Wolf, author of Periods Gone Public, Taking a Stand for Menstrual Equality, and Congresswoman Grace Meng, and Senator Cory Booker. I'm Malika Garib. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you.